Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. We're going to get started. Uh, good, welcome to the last forum of 2022. It's been a great year, and thank you all for being here and supporting women in technology. I'm Andrea Cando, director of WIT Forums, along with my co chair, Lisa Brazell, and I'm also, during my day job, chief payments and strategy officer for Touch Bistro. We have another amazing panel of our WIT. Women of the Year Awards, and we're so happy you're here. Congratulations. Before we start, I have just a few reminders. Please save the date for our next virtual forum on January 18th, featuring Nancy Lieberman. If you don't know who Nancy is, you should look her up. She is a force of nature and an incredible speaker. You will not want to miss it. Our 2023 Women of the Year nominations are also open. So if you or someone you know would like the honor of sitting on this panel next year, go ahead and start submitting your nominations. Also, please tag WIT in your social media postings. There's lots of pictures being taken. You all look beautiful and handsome for our male allies. Uh, so please, please tag us in your, uh, in your social media. I am also grateful to NCR, our title sponsor. Thank you for uh, promoting us and being here. And now we are proud to introduce our panel moderator, Sherry Ferugia, Chief Executive Officer at the Global Center for Medical Innovation and a former WIT Women of the Year Award winner. So good morning, everyone. I see a lot of familiar faces. I'm thrilled to be back here um, for uh, representing WIT again. I think this is my third um, opportunity to moderate for WIT, but uh, anyway, welcome, everyone. We're going to change up the format a little bit this year. We received some feedback, and one of the things that we heard from all of you is that you really wanted to un more understand the journey of the panelists. And, uh, and so we have some individual questions for them. We'll also open it up to the, to the rest of the panelists to, to respond to those questions as well. So we're going to get started. And I'd like for the panelists to introduce themselves and just start by, of course, your name, um, who you work for and your role and what category you won for this year. All right, good morning everyone, it's wonderful to be with you. My name is Angie Brown and I'm a Senior Vice President of Information Technology at the Home Depot. I'm responsible for about half of the development that happens in the organization. Our digital assets like online and mobile, supply chain, merchandising, tech. And from the category perspective, I won for Women of the Year in Technology. Good morning everyone, uh, a real pleasure to be here. My name is Kashmira Date. I am the Global Medical and Scientific Affairs Lead for Vaccines with uh, Johnson & Johnson's Global Public Health Organization. And the category that I won in was the uh, science category. Good morning, everyone. My name is Grant Shi. I'm the CIO of National DCP, and I'm honored to be here. Thank you for having me on this panel, and I won for the Build Her Up category. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Shobha Ramushivaya. Uh, I am with Amazon Music, uh, uh, building a new radio app for Amazon Music. And I am won the category of Women of the Year in uh, Engineering. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rakol Harbin. I work at Belgard. I'm a 3D and production designer. I manage a team, a design team in virtual reality and 3D design. And I won Woman of the Year in the Arts category. Thanks for having me. So for anyone in the audience who knows me, the one thing they know about me is I hate change, um, which is why I'm going to start with this first question. I have embraced it over the years, and so um, Shoba, I'm assuming that you did as well. So you spent 20 years at UPS, I mean, that, that's actually, for some people, that's their entire career. Um, but you spent 20 years at UPS, and then you made the jump to Microsoft and Amazon. Um, after 20 years, how was that? And I'd, I'd like to understand, I'd like for the audience really to understand a little bit about why you made that change and, and how it impacted your career. 
So I started with UPS as an application developer and I wrote lines and lines and lines of code and I was always thinking of myself as an individual contributor, like more like a principal engineer or a distinguished engineer in a company until my VP one day called me to his office and he pointed out that I'm really good with my team and I have this uh, people skills of uh, bringing them together, motivating them and he urged me to start off in an uh, to explore the non-IC route. And uh, there I was starting my journey and uh, I was a director at UPS and uh, well on track to be a VP. So I had spent 20 years there and loved my job and uh, was very passionate about it. I thought I'll retire from UPS. And then in 2019, uh, Microsoft came to Atlanta to uh, establish a uh, software engineering division for Azure. And uh, till then, uh, these companies, uh, big tech companies, had uh, divisions in Atlanta, but it was more for customer solutions, sales, and business, but they didn't have engineering development center here. And I think something about Atlanta, the rich, diverse talent that we have, Georgia Tech and all the other universities, uh, started attracting these companies. And Microsoft came in 2019, and Amazon Music followed uh, in another year. And uh, when I explored this principal engineering manager role at Microsoft, I decided to pursue it to satisfy my technology hunger. And uh, one year later, when Amazon Music reached out, it sounded like my dream job. So I wanted to pursue that. Um, so I had not interviewed for like 20 years. So when I first uh, got this opportunity for Microsoft, I realized it was a hard interview to crack. So. I took time, I took five weeks uh, uh, and asked the recruiter to not set the interview for five weeks. Uh, I called my best friend, understood the exact uh, uh, interview process, uh, ordered two books, systems design and uh, cracking the coding interview at Big Tech. Uh, I know I didn't have to do the coding interview at my level, but uh, there were mixed signals saying that I may be asked, so I kind of like went ahead and uh, ordered those books, opened a lead code account, and uh, worked a lot for five weeks. I even took a week off from office. Uh, and uh, I remember staying up till 2 a.m. in the night and preparing myself. And uh, uh, there I was, I was able to crack the, both the interviews. And once I had Microsoft and Amazon was an easier path, uh, I just had to uh, understand the leadership principles and get the behavioral things right. And um, after I joined these companies, uh, uh, the I had, I mean, the uh, transition was hard, I mean, at least for the first few months. Uh, suddenly, I was surrounded by a bunch of smart people, and I had to uh, unlearn about stressing about getting things done or moving things in a project. I mean, uh, there was a lot of ownership around the room, and uh, if a manager or an engineer gives me a date, and they would stick to it. So I had to unlearn to channelize my energy there, but. Uh, uh, there were different challenges. There were a lot of strong people in the room with strong opinions, so I had to learn to step in and disambiguate it uh, at the right time to make it smooth and also enable the talent uh, the, around me. Um, and uh, also there was a lot of people who are in the company for a very long time and they knew only one way, Microsoft way or <laughs> Amazon way. And I know it happens with every company. I probably had it my, on my own, like a UPS way, but these were very strong opinions. So I had to kind of learn to uh, tackle a way to explain them the world out from outside. And uh, it went pretty smooth after I was able to establish my reputation in the company. So here I am with 20 years of UPS and three years in the big tech. And I'm very happy about my Atlanta community and uh, want more and more of all these companies to come over to Atlanta. Well, you've, I mean, that was certainly a huge transition for you. And I think there's a couple of takeaways. One is don't ever wait 20 years to interview. That's the first thing. <laughs> Anytime anybody wants to interview you, take them up on it. It keeps your skills sharp. Um, so that I know had to be very stressful. And the second thing is, is that if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. So I think you made a very wise choice and congratulations on that. Um, so I'm gonna shift gears a little bit, um, you know, Angie, because you have a similar story, but you stayed. And with one of my favorite places, by the way, um, at Home Depot, so, or the Home Depot, as I like to say. Um, and I'd like to understand a little bit about, you know, your career path at Home Depot and why you have, have chosen to stay. It's very rare these days. Um, you know, you see it in some of, I mean, you, 
quite frankly, you see it in a lot of companies like Southern Company, people stay forever, right? Um, but it is, it's more and more rare. So if you could help us understand a little bit about why you stayed and, and how that's really directed your career. Absolutely. So I will readily admit when I took the job with Home Depot two weeks out of college, I didn't really think about being there for over two decades. And, you know, so it's been a journey along the way that's unfolded a lot different than I would have ever, ever written the story um, in the early days. I think one of the things about a company like Home Depot, and Grant and I were talking about some of this earlier, in my 24 years, it's always been a growth organization. We grow, we've grown in different ways. We are still to this day growing, and not just as it relates to the size of the company or the health of the business, same thing on the technology side. And I've had the, it's never felt like the same job. That is a silver lining of these large companies if you haven't spent time in one. I've done anything from, you know, I started as an entry level developer as well, wrote code for a number of years. And then I, you know, over time I did anything from switching out our servers in the stores, changing the OS for the entire footprint. I, you know, implemented an ERP, you can, you can kind of name it. I got to see a lot of different things and a lot of different parts of the business. And there were definitely some phone calls along the way. And there were definitely some times that, you know, maybe I, I picked up the phone too. And I got really close uh, with one opportunity. And um, s similar, you know, I'm, I'm out there trying to assert like, is it relates to my career, am I holding myself back from being at the same company for 24 years? It was a big question in my head. And I, but I have gotten very used to the pace and the scale of this large company, and I wanted something that challenged me above that. And there aren't that many companies out there that are, are bigger, but one, you know, in particular was, and I had an opportunity in their C-suite. And I went, and I was talking to our CEO at the time, and, you know, I just said, I, I love this company, but am I really even doing the best job I can be when this is all I know? Like, if you think about who could come in and be the best now SVP, like, isn't it somebody also that maybe has some more industry aperture? And so it was always kind of through that lens of am I still to where I'm still learning, I'm still growing, I'm, and I'm still, the, you know, in a position to add as much value as possible. And... There have been times in my career along the way that I've had to find additional ways to continue to grow or find a different additional ways to add value. One of the things that I ended up doing at that time was based on that conversation, um, you know, it was if you're worried about like what else is going on in the industry, how strong are your industry connections and what else can you do on that front? And so I did a CIO class with Carnegie Mellon just to kind of get into a different room, like you were saying, and to experience some different things. But at the core, like having, you know, creating that path and then I was with a company whose values I loved. And so the fact that I could continue to find that path with a company whose values I loved, and you know, as you're looking at companies, knowing you know their support for your growth and what that trajectory can look like, is really critical. And it's just in a lot of ways, it's felt like a, a blessing that um, you know when I chose this job because I could wear jeans, it turned into <laughs> um, a company that's had this type of uh, growth over the time that it has. Yeah, so I think uh, one of the takeaways, Angie, and thanks for sharing that, is to be with a company where you can walk into your boss's office. At the time for you, it was the CEO, and say, you know, I have this opportunity, and I'd like to discuss it with you. This, it's not a threat. It's, you know, I want to understand if I'm doing the best job for, for you and the company, um, and, uh, and, and is there an opportunity for me to continue to grow? And so I think that speaks volumes for the other thing that you talked about, which were the values, right? right? The, home, the Home Depot wants what's best for you as well. Um, so really appreciate that, you know, really appreciate sharing that. Um, so Grant, we're gonna, we're gonna switch gears again and, and talk a little bit about, you know, about your role and how you have supported, um, you know, WIT. And as the winter, as the winner of the Build, Builder Up Award, um, you know, one of the things that we really looked at was how you value advocacy and inclusivity. 
uh, and how you have supported women in their careers. I, I talked with, with Grant earlier before we got on stage and I asked him if he had any children. He has four, he has two of each, uh, and he has two girls. Uh, ages five and, and 16, and I think that also probably really drove you uh, and inspired you to, uh, uh, to support the next generation, the current generation and the next generation. So if you could tell us a little bit about that, what, what has inspired you and what really are um, you know, your, your goals as you look to advocacy and inclusivity? Yeah, no, thank you for that. Uh, so, if some of you know that I have an organization called the It Girls Foundation. It's something I'm really proud of. It's something that my oldest daughter actually inspired me to do seven years ago when she was nine years old. And that is a foundation that's focused on bringing STEM in a very real life, similar to this kind of setting, to fourth and fifth grade girls. Uh, and I think the driving force behind that is, you know, first let me just pause and acknowledge the people in this room. I've seen a huge evolution of where we've come, especially with women in technical fields. Uh, it's not just the numbers, right? It's not just the, the fact that we have a room full of people doing successful things and, and having important roles in big companies, but I think it's starting to evolve into more of the more important aspect, which is the inclusion. And that's kind of what It Girls truly focuses on, and it's trying to provide a space for people to feel like they're part of something, part of something bigger. You know, when I hear stories like Shoba's, uh, somebody in her past decided this is a chance to include her on something beyond what she's doing now. And so I, say, I think if you think about your careers, who are the people who help you feel that inclusivity? Because at the end of the day, we can sit here and say diversity inclusion is the right thing to do, but that's kind of subjective, right? That's my value system versus yours versus someone else's. I think there is a fundamental human element we all want to feel included, right? We all want to feel inclusion, and I think you get the optimal use of someone, the optimal output, the optimal engagement when somebody feels like they're part of something. Um, obviously, I'm not a woman. I don't know what it's like to be a woman. I will tell you, though, in my experience, I have gone through many points in my life where I've not felt included, and it's not a good feeling, and I think we can all empathize and understand that. And I wasn't at my best until I got to a point where I felt more a part of something whether it was in school or in sports or in work or in life, doesn't matter. You get the optimal usage of your resource when that resource feels like they are part of something. So again, to, you know, I hope I'm answering your question, but I think the reason I, I and others advocate for it so much is it goes beyond doing the right thing. I think if you are a, a good leader, if you want to get the most out of people, you want to optimize your resources, you've got to fake inclusion part of it because it's that it's a human, it's a human element. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that we like to say at, at Georgia Tech is um, to take it one step further, do you feel like you belong? Um, you know, we can have, you know, diversity, we can have inclusivity, but what I heard you say really is there were times when you didn't feel like you belonged. And, and we, everyone in this room has a responsibility, in my, in my personal opinion, um, to, uh, to ensure that the people we, that we work with, the individuals we mentor, uh, have that feeling of, of belonging. So really strive to take it one step further and not just include, but to embrace uh, belonging. So thank you for that, and thank you for your advocacy. Uh, I know that your, your girls um, are very proud of them. I know your entire family is, but particularly your girls. Um, so, Ricole, I think you have one of, had one of the most difficult, um, I don't know if I want to say career paths, maybe career goals of creating that personal brand. That is very hard to do, and you've done a tremendous job with that. And for anyone who's ever created a personal brand, it's not just about even how you, how you look, it's about your values. So I would love for you to share with, um, with the room really how you were successful in, in taking your values and incorporating that into a brand that led to you building a very successful business. Thank you for that question. That's an awesome question, isn't it? I would say that, one, I'm the first woman to hold the position 
at my company as a production and 3D modeler. I'm also the first woman of color. So there were a lot of, not barriers, but there was a lot that was required of me to teach people how to be more inclusive and to diversify our department. A lot of people are willing, but I also found that, you know, as minority, we have to make sure that we are also including ourselves. It's not always about waiting for to be recognized or to be given the seat, but to find out where the seats are, where the doors are, and to be proactive in knocking and walking through and having those elevator conversations. So I found a lot of success just in training myself. I had a really great book that the VP gave to me in the elevator. And it taught me, it was called um, Think, like a Think Like a Man, Win Like a Woman. That was a great book. It's a great book for anybody to read, honestly. And it taught me to stop putting myself in the positions that I didn't want. Perfect example was I became the cupcake lady, literally, in my department. I became the team mom in my department. I do have three children myself. So, you know, it's easy to see the, the nurturing side. But I didn't want to be the cupcake lady. But it wasn't their fault that I had become the cupcake lady. Anything someone asked me to do because I thought that that was the way to get opportunity, I said, sure, I can do the cupcakes. But I didn't want to do the cupcakes. So this taught me to be more assertive, clear, and direct, not as polite, to not always wait for the right opportunities to speak up, but to speak up. It's fine to interject. So. I think that has been key to uh, my success or the transition of success. Well, and you advocated for yourself. And, and through that advocacy, you found your voice. Absolutely. And, and, and that is, and it is okay to, and then what you did was you realized that it was okay to say no. Um, that is, mm -hmm. I think, particularly for, for women, that is really hard to it say is. no. Um, to the point to where my first boss at Georgia Tech uh, came in my office and gave me a no button. Have you guys ever seen the no button? <laughs> it's on Amazon. Oh, wow. Um, and, and so it's, uh, and, and I kind of chuckled, but, you know, she said, you have to learn to say no. I mean, it, it's, it practice it. And if you can't verbalize it, just push the button. <laughs> so, um, uh, Last week, I was out with my husband, and we were we were up in the D.C. area, and uh, we were in one of the gift shops, and he had never seen my no button because it's in the office. And he's like, oh, my gosh, there's a no button? And I said, yeah. And he says, well, I'm buying one. I said, well, good luck with that. So <laughs> you better be buying the yes, dear button. Um, so after 36 years, a no button, I don't think so. But... You, you do have to, to advocate for yourself, find your voice, and, and, and learn to say yes to the opportunities that are going to help advance you, and sometimes walk away from others. So thanks for sharing Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Thank you. Kashmira, um, this, I was very intrigued by this question. Um, we, ahead of time, we asked the panelists to send us some questions that would help them you know, share their story. And, and I'm very intrigued by this one. You mentioned the issue of over-mentored and under-sponsored. Um, and I'd love for you to talk a little bit about, well, one, just really what that means. What, um, what drove you to even to go there? about over-mentoring and, and over-sponsored, and, um, and what are some things that we should look for if, if, that's, if, that, if that's coming down the path? How should we look for that? Absolutely. You know, I'll, I'll share a little bit about my journey. Uh, so before I came into my, my position, I used to be, or I worked with this, uh, the CDC for a number of years, and so I did make that transition, a huge transition from that, you know, public health space into the private industry, but still kind of staying on the public health side of things. So I, I, you know, I think for me, it was really important to sort of realize the difference between a mentor and a sponsor. 
you know, I think we are just kind of attuned to thinking about we need more mentorship. You know, women in general, there's always more we can do, there's more advice we can seek, there's somebody who can help us, guide us. You know, so that sort of difference between a mentor and then what's really a sponsor? I mean, when I kind of like, even until a few years ago, didn't quite, that didn't quite sink in for me that what a sponsor could really do. You know, and, and if you have a chance, read this book, forget the mentor, get a sponsor. Or, you know, what got you here won't get you there. So it's really, I mean, you know, the mentor kind of speaks to you, a sponsor speaks for you, puts your name forward when those opportunities arise. And, and you know, so I think it's, it's really trying to be more intentional about finding those kind of opportunities. Because we can always get more mentorship and you know, uh, there's always more guiding and principles that we can try to follow. But I think it's really when you're looking for that career growth and that trajectory, a sponsor can make a huge difference because these are people who are in rooms where you're not and what you need is somebody to actually put your name forward on your behalf when you're not there. So I think for me, and when you look at the statistics, right, like women have, you know, three times more the number of mentors than men have. But when you look at sponsors, men have twice the number of sponsors that women have. And so I think it's really important to make sure that you sort of build those relationships and nurture those relationships. Now, of course, this doesn't happen overnight. And so I think, you know, really kind of for me, what, what, what helped was I actually was tremendously lucky to be a part of this phenomenal journey called Women Lift Health. And this was a program that was sponsored and, and hosted by, by Stanford. We got a bunch of mid-career women together to sort of provide the tools and, and the resources to be able to rise in, in more senior level positions. And it was really transformative for me to even like, you know, change that mindset, that thinking about how and you know, what you really need to do. How do you define your why? And I'm sure everybody is aware of that, you know, your why and the what and the how. So being clear about where you're going. And then in that realm, trying to seek out not just the mentors, but the sponsors and being, you know, kind of starting to develop that, that relationship. So, I mean, I've found, and, and you know, sponsors don't have to be senior leaders. I mean, you know, we are so lucky to have a he for she or a she for she who can, <laughs> who does that. But, you know, I mean, I think it could be even your peers. Somebody, I, I think, you know, often, and we, that, you know, when there's one seat at the table, women are often competing with each other, and we don't need that. Rise and lift as you rise. So once you have that mindset, I think it just becomes so much easier for all of us to rise together. So that's the one thing that I really learned from, you know, that sort of network that, that I developed. And also like, you know, having some of these sponsors, like I got introduced to WIT by my best friend who is in this, you know, space and, and thought of me when the nominations were happening. So, you know, I think that's the kind of network you need to have. And then I think at organizational levels, there's so much more we can do. You know, we've already heard about the DNI, so, you know, just don't have those diversity, equity, inclusion policies for the sake of it, but really try to figure out those impactful, um, you know, not just policies, but actions that will actually make a difference. So are there things that we could do, you know, like, be, to be one, you make one leader, you know, to, uh, to try to have performance evaluations that really look at, you know, the, the people skills, or the, you know, the people leadership skills, and how do you build somebody up? And so I think in that realm, if we can start thinking, I, that's why I felt like, you know, really mentoring is not the issue, it's really the sponsorship. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, to be more intentional about finding that sponsor is, is really important as well. Um, and, and one of the takeaways for the audience is that, you know, the sponsor doesn't have to be uh, even someone in leadership. And, and I have found that some of my biggest sponsors have even been outside of GCMI, they've been outside of Georgia Tech, they've been outside of where, where, I've, where I've worked. And, um, and that, you know, I think that also speaks to don't burn bridges, people. Um, so uh, there, there is that. But, um, and I, I do want to correct myself because earlier I did say um, over-mentored and over-sponsored, it's actually over-mentored and under-sponsored. Um, so be intentional about those sponsors. Uh, 
so this, I'm going to now switch to asking a question to all, all the panelists. And, and the, the question here, but I'm going to, of course, you guys know me, I'm going to change it up a little bit. Um, the question is actually, who influences you today in your career? But I'd, I'd really like to, to know, and I think it would be interesting for the audience to know as well, is that really who influenced you early on? So much of who we are today, I think, is because of what happened maybe 20 years ago, five years ago, 10 years, 30 years ago. If you're me, it could be longer than that. Um, maybe 40 years ago. But uh, really, not just who inspired you, but who influenced you. So we'll start with you, Angie. If I look back over the years, there's definitely been, a, I think, a number of names that would um, fill that fill that description. And I think that that is also one interesting takeaway. You get inspiration at different times in your career from different things and from people that have had different experiences. And so, you know, I, I'm constantly drawing, I think, inspiration from a lot of different individuals on a lot of different topics, honestly. But one of the in, one of the individuals that really sticks out in my career was a technologist who loved leadership, like studied, truly studied what leadership, great leadership looked like and looked at it like a skill. And there was a period of time, um, which it is, but there was a period of time that I would say, you know, from an organizational perspective, we were surrounded more with people who were great technologists who also had soft skills and therefore became leaders and maybe didn't necessarily have invested as much time in what great leadership looks like and this person had. And so just a tremendous amount of one recognition that like anything else, you can learn the skill of leadership and you should invest time in the qualities of great leadership and then there was a very pivotal moment that still resonates with me. I had walked in and I mean, honestly, I was complaining about something, you know, and we were having a conversation and he stopped me and he was like, Angie, you need to remember everyone's trying to do their best work. And this theory of like, I had, had stood in a place where I was like, why isn't this working? So-and-so is just not, trying or this or that and it was like hold on no have the empathy to understand what's going on in their space and understand what's keeping them from being successful because they want to be successful just like you want to be successful and so that was one of the big learnings i feel like that um I, you know i took away and that type of leadership has been you know something that has really resonated with me yeah, and I think that speaks to how that has influenced you as a leader mm -hmm. um, as, you've, as you've grown through your career. I had a, I had a similar moment where um, I was extremely frustrated, and the CEO of the company said to me, if, who was a, I guess you're never really a retired Marine, was a former Marine, and he said, if you continue to judge everyone based upon how you are and how you work, you're going to be disappointed your entire life. Um, and that, I mean, I stopped, was like, yikes, you know, I didn't realize I was doing that, but I absolutely was. And, you know, you have to meet people where they are, and that's just a sign of a really good, a good leader. So tell us a little bit about your influences. You know, for me, I think, again, it's, it's been so many different influences over, over my journey. And of course, you know, it starts with family and like really having my mom believe in me and you know growing up in a in a traditionally patriarchal society it was not easy right and so i think that was something that really instilled that confidence in me and then i think over time and, and you know luckily for me i was you know i knew i wanted to become a doctor but then you know when i started kind of going more into the public health space you know somebody really my my, my spouse my husband who influenced me and really inspired me to think higher than I was like, oh, I don't know if I could really do it. Like, do, can both of us have these, you know, high profile careers? Maybe I'll take a back seat. And he was like, I don't think so. I think both of us can do it. I'm here to support you. And that I think made a huge difference for me. And then I think, you know, like I was tell telling you about this women, uh, women lift health leadership journey. You know, that difference between a manager and a leader and what does a leader really do? How does a leader inspire? For me, you know, having that entire, 
um, you know, sort of that, that peer network that inspired me, you know, like really helped me identify where I belonged. And then you, you know, had these phenomenal leaders who showed through their actions what leadership looks like. And so that to me has been really inspiring, you know, throughout my journey now. And that's what I want to do when I, you know, as, as I uh, go forward in my, in my career. Well, it sounds like your husband might be up for the Build Her Up Award next year. <laughs> so. <laughs> it's nominated. That's right. Have to nominate him. Um, so, so, Grant, I'd, I'd love for you to talk to us a little bit about, you know, um, who has influenced you, and, and particularly if there were any females in your life who influenced you. Yeah, so let me share a story from way back. I started my career in consulting and I remember the first live piece of code I wrote on my first job. And I was, wrote it, and I was so proud, and I hit the compile button, and the very first thing that came back was a 101 error. <laughs> and in COBOL land, a 101 error, as you know, is an internal file not found. It is the most basic error, and it preceded a list of errors that was longer than the code that I wrote. <laughs> and I remember at the time, my team lead uh, turned and said, maybe this isn't for you. And it was, a, it was a joke, it was, you know, in the spirit of fun and all that, but uh, obviously I took it pretty hard, and I thought, geez, maybe this isn't for me. And I actually remember distinctly there was a, a female partner at Accenture who took the time to pull me aside and said, you know, I didn't get my first code to not compile, but on my first day on this project, I also walked out of the bathroom with toilet paper on my shoe. And I think hearing that story made me realize no one's going to be perfect. And the fact that you make mistakes shows and proves that when you do get it right, you weren't lucky. Right? If I had written that perfectly, who knows if it was actually something I knew or I just got lucky. But because I made those mistakes and I knew how to get past the 101 error now, uh, the next time I did something, it kind of showed that I, I learned. Right? It showed progress. It showed evolution. And so I was very uh, humbled and touched that this partner was able to be open with me and to share her story. And it just made me feel like, all right, I'm going to have trip ups. I'm going to have problems. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make mistakes. It's not the end of the world. And people before me have done it too. Uh, and so I think that's a, a, that was a huge influence just at the very start of my career. I just got very lucky being surrounded by people who took the time to do that and and took the time to empathize with me. Yeah, I mean, there's a common theme here, and it's leadership and empathy, and words matter. You know, the, I'm sure the person who said that to you about your, you know, your code not compiling said it in jest, but particularly to someone young in their career, words really do matter. Um, so thanks for sharing that. So Shoba, how about you? Yeah, so I have a lot of people in my life who kind of influenced me all day long and uh, with a lot of things. But there was this one changing moment in my uh, life, like maybe five, ten years, ten years ago. Um, I don't read a lot of books, but uh, biography, autobiographies are one, one of my favorites. And I ended up reading Steve Jobs' book like almost two to three times. Uh, and uh, one thing that stood out as I read that book was how weird and unique he was. And uh, uh, because of his weird obsession to iPhone, I mean, because of his weird obsession to design, I mean, we would not have had our iPhone uh, today if not for his weirdness. So one thing I took from that book was to be like, uh, to be okay to be unique. I mean, I'm nothing but like Steve Jobs where I'm probably the nicest person in a room, but uh, one thing I took for myself was like, it's okay to be unique and it's not, uh, you don't have to suppress yourself. Uh, like for example, I'm a very emotional person and uh, I take that with me. And uh, in the professional world, it can make people uncomfortable when you're emotional, but uh, I have decided like not to, uh, hold it back and if, as long as I'm genuine and uh, uh, not hurting anyone, that, that works. And that has worked always with my team. Like even recently, I know you, might, you all must have heard like there's a lot of layoffs happening in the tech companies and uh, recently uh, in my team, a lot of people were laid off and uh, there was this org wide email that came out like after a week when things settled. Uh, and the org wide email was uh, celebrating a launch with a lot of e people on the email. And some of those people were actually laid off and were from my team. And 
uh, I was reading that email at 11 o'clock in the night and the, my first instinct was to emotionally respond to that about how I felt. And I didn't care, I responded to the entire org about uh, how uh, these people who are departing from us will be missed. They were the heroes and uh, uh, and I even wrote in the email saying I got emotional thinking about our journey of launching this uh, big product. Uh, and uh, the, that, that that's one thing that's influenced me and I think that has helped me a lot. Uh, people see through me and how I care and uh, not holding things back has helped me a lot and helped me connect with people and also uh, it makes it a win-win situation in a team environment. Well, I think that it keeps it real. Um, you know, and it, again, you know, we, I, I personally believe that everything starts and ends with empathy. And that really is the, the beginning and the end of being a, a, a great leader. Um, your team needs to know that, that, um, that you do have feelings. And, and that is okay. Um, they will go to the ends of the earth for you if they believe that, uh, that you care about them. So you were right to be who you are, the, to be authentic, and um, to, to lead the way that you're leading. So I congratulate you on that. Okay, Raquel. I have a lot of influences as well. Uh, the first influence I would say is Lady Drew. May she rest in peace. She was the CFO, and she was, um, if anybody has ever seen The Devil Wears Prada, oh, you I, know was, it. I was her assistant. And uh, <laughs> she taught me that what you have to say is just as valuable as everyone else. She also taught me to stop letting people take credit for your work. That was, that was powerful. Uh, the next influence, I would say, is our CIO, Kim Trevisan, who's also a part of WIT. You know Kim. And uh, she's a tough cookie. You know, she is. And she coached me a little bit before the awards. And I said, Kim, what am I going to say if I should win? And she says, just speak from your heart. Those are the best speeches, the ones that are unprepared. And I was like, uh. <laughs> but I did... <laughs> But I did just that, and uh, that's what I'm doing today. And probably moving forward is just speaking from the heart. And then uh, Joe Ray Boyne, who is the director of our department, who brought me back after I left. I didn't stay the whole six years. I went into engineering, and I was like, okay, this is not for me. If you have a spot, he brought me back, and he was my advocate. He negotiated at those tables and gave me beyond what I asked. So you definitely need that. And my number one, of course, is my children. I'm a single mother, proud. Uh, my children are awesome. So if there are any single mothers out there, don't believe those statistics. You can do it. And they motivate me every day. So just to get here, I mean, you know, we got three different bus loads. We got to make sure everybody takes showers and so the fact, the, the fact that I have on some blush, you guys, that's, that's the real motivation. So, thank you. But those are my, my biggest influences. And the avid, you know, I, there's actually one more. Let me just be honest here. The most challenging manager that I've ever worked with and I mean, he gave me the hardest of times and he would embarrass me in emails and all of that. But that actually probably propelled me to this new level of I'm gonna say what I have to say. I'm gonna take the opportunities that I need to take, you know, and I'm gonna do my part, you know, and I'm definitely not gonna be that type of leader. So, you know, hopefully my team would say that about me, that I do care and they know that I care. I give them the honesty and uh, hopefully I'm teaching them as well how to position themselves. Well, girl, I always say, not that I believe in revenge, but <laughs> if I did. If, if, if we if did, I did. If we did. The best revenge is living well. Isn't it? So hats off to you. Amen to that. Thank you. Can I can Absolutely. I add to that because I think that was that was very very important what you said and I had a very similar experience when somebody actually almost destroys your career and I think you know what what your reaction was 
was, I mean, you know, that initial, like, getting out of that shock and then coming out of it, I think if you've heard, you know, Stacey Abrams give this tremendous TED Talk, don't let setbacks set you back. Mm -hmm. And, Amen. you know, there are a lot of things you can learn from that in terms of what not to do and how do you, that's, that's the revenge strategy, right? Yeah, to do I've better. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, there's two things I want to get through, and I know that we're, we're running out of time here, but um, you all have, have been uh, involved in the community, and your community work and engagement is part of the reason that you're on this stage today. Now that you have, uh, you know, one uh, woman of the year in technology, how do you plan to use that to further advance your work in the community? And Angie, we'll start with you. Wow. Um, all right. So I, I'm thinking through that. And there's, there's a couple of things. You know, I would say that in my early career days, I wasn't as involved with the community. And it was really a missed opportunity, I feel like. Um, and from where I sit now and to see the people that, you know, we're surrounded with up here, you really understand, I think, the the value of the lift up, right? And the value of helping. And I, I referenced, I think it was during the interview process for this, um, that type of work and helping others, not only do I think that through a process like this, you, be, you become even more like cognizant of how meaningful and how important it is, but you're also more motivated. And not only motivated, but also you, you, I drive so much of my um, enjoyment now on what's going on with the others that I work with, not necessarily what's going on with me. And so definitely I think this gives us a platform to do even, even more of that. Totally, and just to add to that, I think, you know, starting early, so one of the things that, that I'm trying to do is to, you know, get more involved with school programs. Um, how do we get that mindset with the girls started earlier and really help them understand this authentic sort of leadership from their lens and how do you sort of, you know, go into that, that trajectory. Um, and then I think it's, it's really, you know, sort of these networks that we build within our community. So I'm actually really energized by, you know, like these kind of forums, what I bring from Women Lift Health. How can you have this sort of personal professional network in many ways? Because there are things that, you know, in our professional world with our, with our immediate colleagues, there are things that you may, may not be able to share. So can you get together, like, you know, sort of these lean-in circles or, you know, what, what we want to call it as these personal professional networks that you can, you know, relate with certain things. You can brainstorm ideas, think through, help somebody else help you think through, or, you know, get somebody else to help uh, you think through. How do you sort of put that together? So that's, you know, one of the areas that I'm really interested in developing and, and trying to move forward. So Grant, how about you? I, you know, it's an honor to be recognized and acknowledged for this. I'm not sure it changes a whole lot. Uh, I think it's part of the evolution of, for me personally, what I want to do for what I think the, the mission of WIT is and the mission of uh, all these movements and, and organizations to try to advance and, and grow. So, you know, for me, I think it's a great reminder to people that folks are paying attention, that it's important to advocate for each other. We talked about it here today, this morning, uh, being a sponsor, not a mentor. So speaking up, not just for yourself, but for those around you. And I think this is a good reminder of it. But honestly, I want to look back in three years and go, why did I win that? You know, what I'm doing now and where I've evolved to now puts me in a much better position than what I did three years ago. So I hope we all take that as a reminder that this is a point in time thing. Uh, you know, enjoy it. I, I'm not taking anything away from that. But the reality is, I think it's just one step in the growth and evolution that we talk about. Yeah. And it also, I think, brings a tremendous amount of credibility to the work that you're doing adds to the credibility to the to the work that you're doing um so shoba yeah for me like i've always been doing a lot with girls coding workshop being a java teacher at teals program and uh, um, uh, working with hbcu for uh, pilot internship programs and things like that but winning this award and like, consciously thinking about this uh, is putting me at a 
point in life where I want to do something more bigger. Uh, and I feel like with Amazon and uh, the support that I can get from them, I think I can do something big. I'm dreaming about it. Hopefully two or three years from now, I'll be able to uh, say something where there's a much more impact of maybe training people to get into uh, uh, these tech companies or uh, getting into this company. So I, I'm thinking a lot, so thinking big. Well, good. good. And Rakul? Uh, what has definitely propelled my probably personal initiative to work with under-supported communities, um, it's also shed a huge light on, I kind of still felt like the smaller person in the company. Um, and I think it's shed a light on the things that I was already doing in the community. So my company has a, an inclusion and diversity sector that's called Mosaic. And they reached out to me and pretty much gave me like the green light to just keep doing what I'm doing in the community. So I've been working with um, children in high schools. I've been doing a lot of speaking to girls in the STEM programs. I've uh, honestly helped a lot of women become incorporated themselves. My friend is here. She can attest to that. Hi. And, uh, you know, just in becoming incorporated as women, a lot of times we don't know how to do that or where to start. Like, what's the first thing I do? Do I do my logo or my name? So we've done a lot of that. And um, just women in transition, I think, is, is key, which kind of aligns to definitely WIT's initiative, especially with the single mother's program, I think is phenomenal. Um, so kudos to WIT for that. So it's just an amazing organization to be a part of. So now I have the funding to, to go to these communities and offer things to them and be the voice because I was the under-supported kid as well. So I'm the one that comes from those communities that a lot of times people are afraid to go into. They like to donate from afar, but I physically want to get my hands dirty and roll up my sleeves and connect with the kids and tell them that I am you. And I think that that makes a difference as opposed to, you know, sometimes we see the suits and the glamour and everything that we are now, and it doesn't relate or translate to uh, the community that is hurting. So yeah. definitely want to let them know that uh, you can do it. I'm a product of that. And meet them where they are. I mean, I think that's really important. That's what I hear. I think I hear you, you say. So thank you, panelists, for that. We're going to end with... Um, with, with one word, that's it. You're only allowed to say one word uh, on how your peers would describe you. Not how you would describe yourself, but how your peers would, would describe you. Grant, go. <laughs> Succinct. Go ahead, Shoba. Empathetic. 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 Recall. Tough. <laughs> Angie. Engaged. Passionate. Those are good words. Mine would, would, would say I was crazy. So there you go. <laughs> uh, panelists, you've been wonderful. Audience, uh, I think, do we have time for questions? Are we doing questions, guys? Yes? OK. So let's start with, uh, well, first, let's give this, the panelists a round of applause. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you. And, and now we're going to go to questions. Anyone in the audience have a question? Raise your hand and we'll bring a mic to you. Questions, anyone? Very surprised. Yes, question over there. Or a couple of questions, one here first. Okay, what would you say to the little you if you could speak back to the little girl or the little young man? I think my big thing would be don't, you know, don't beat yourself up when you make a mistake. I spent too much of my career thinking I needed to be perfect. Um, and so that would, that's definitely comes top of mind for me. Grant, I saw you reach for your mic real quick. Yeah, I guess don't over plan. You know, life, life what? is going to change. Life's going to throw you curveballs. So being flexible and anticipating that kind of stuff, uh, it's, you know, yeah, my wife knows this. I'm a big believer in guidelines, and uh, the younger version of me probably could have uh, used that advice a little sooner. 
And I think my thing is, even if you're loving your job or loving what you're doing, uh, just have an eye open uh, for what's out there. I would say you're an artist. <laughs> That's it. I mean, I used to take pictures of rocks and skies and trees and nobody understood it then. You know, back then it wasn't like a thing to be a designer. So I, I think I would have told myself that a lot earlier and saved a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, no, I beat myself up a lot. So I would say to myself, believe in yourself. No matter what, you'll be okay. Uh, this question's for Grant. Um, from a build her up perspective, how can men in this day and age, help support women? Wow, good, good and, question. Well, men in non-leadership positions. That's a great question. Yeah, terrific question. I think it starts with understanding what the individual wants uh, and not using your own definitions for things. So I think as men, we tend to get to a point where you know, you, you, we have diff different words and we joke about mansplaining, we joke about you know, these things, but there's a reality to it. I think there's a lot of assumptions that we make, there's a lot of definitions that we use, and so I think if we as men spend more time understanding that, that's our definition of something. And the person that I'm speaking to, whether it's a male or female, has probably a different definition that I need to understand myself before I'm able to give advice, before I'm able to mansplain something, right? I, I need to hear that person. I need to understand what's your definition of career growth? What's your definition of an opportunity? What's your definition of being included? And so I think if we focus more on listening to those definitions and understanding how to work with them rather than jumping straight to the advice or, hey, I'm an awesome mentor. Look at all the people I've gotten promoted. That's not important to the individual, right? We wanna be heard, come back to that point we made earlier around you are at your best when you feel included. You are at your best when you feel heard. So I think for all the men out there, you know, focus on the definition, right? Seek to understand. Translation, no mansplaining. <laughs> or, or, or quite frankly, womansplaining. Sometimes I get that at home. It's like, honey, please. Don't, don't, don't womansplain to me either. Um, is there any more, any more questions out there? I have one here. Uh, great job by all the panelists, first and foremost. Uh, this question is for Ricole. Love your story. Um, would you mind kind of unpacking your growth and evolution in terms of just developing your own self-advocacy? One of the things you mentioned as an example, right, is not allowing people to take credit for your work. Mm -hmm. So I've been in that kind of position before. I'm sure others perhaps have as well. But talk about how you reclaim that your power back, right, in that, in that instance, if you could. How did I reclaim my power? I started speaking up more at tables and not shifting my work to the left for other people as much. I started, um, you, you, you know, honestly, you are going to have to get uncomfortable with ruffling some feathers. That's what I had to, to learn to do. Sometimes you have to go beyond you know, uh, the direct contact for you. That's always, I think, scary grounds. You're like, okay, well, this is my point of contact. And then behind the point of contact is actually the decision maker. I think you have to be really elegant in the way that you do it. I think that you have to be inclusive yourself in the way that you do it. But a uh, perfect example, I had a very basic initiative that I wanted to push through and it was just taking longer than what I knew that it needed to. And it was just because of the personalities. So I sent an email, put the initiative in there after I had given ample amount of time. You know, give the time that the person says that they need, well let me get with this person. But after that, I sent the email, put both of the people on there, said hey, What's the feedback? So there, it wasn't anything that was considered shady or done in the dark. But definitely getting comfortable with ruffling some feathers because even though I included that person, they still may have been a little bit uncomfortable that you know I've already gotten my initiative through. But here it is 24 hours later and that initiative is already moving. So it was worth it and I think ultimately um, I seek to be respected more in my 40s than uh, light 
in my 20s and 30s, you know, and so on and so forth. So now I really want the respect. I want you to see that she's professional and that she gets the job done. So if that ruffles feathers, I think the right people can respect that. Thanks for that question. That was a great question. Yeah, I, I think that we are at the end of our questions. Um, I'm sure that you can find our panelists on LinkedIn. Uh, feel free to, you know, to connect with them. We appreciate everyone coming today. And do we have some closing? No, I'm closing it up. Okay, well, I'm, we're done. <laughs> Thank you.